The Vox AC30 is almost certainly a guitar amp that changed the world, although you would not have guessed this from its humble beginnings and unlikely rise to glory. During World War II, Thomas Walter Jennings worked for the Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers, but was discharged in 1942 on medical grounds. He went to work at the Vickers Munition Plant in Kent, and while there he was to meet with big band musician and part-time inventing shed tinkerer Dick Denny. Like Jennings, Denny enjoyed nothing better than tinkering with electronics and radio technology. Immediately the two struck up a friendship which would not only outlast their wartime service but would lead on to one of the most groundbreaking partnerships in the music industry as we know it. Tom Jennings was born in Hackney, London, England in February 1917 and according to the recollection of many was a natural entertainer from an early age. John Oram, later to become an apprentice for Jennings in 1964, recalled seeing him first as a child at the age of six. He used to wait for kids to come out of school and he would follow them home with an accordion on his back riding a bicycle. He would wait until you'd gone in, usually with your mum, because at that age you were escorted home. You'd get in and there'd be a knock on the door and this actually happened to me so I'm speaking from experience. Mum would answer the door and Tom would be there with his accordion playing it. With a big smile on his face he'd say, Madam, I see you've got a very nice little boy there, how would you like him to be able to play the accordion like this? Tom would earn by giving accordion lessons. In 1944 Jennings started repairing accordions and trading in second-hand musical instruments, part-time at first. In 1946 Jennings set up his first shop in Dartford, Kent next door to a fish and chip shop. He began importing accordions and other musical instruments. He also invented new products including the Univox electric organ which was a huge success and not only inspired the Vox brand name, but was the springboard for his musical instrument amplifier manufacturing empire. In fact, often the Univox was mistaken for the distinctive sound of the Ivan Novello award-winning Telstar theme, written by Joe Meek for the Tornadoes. That tune was in fact played on the claviline, which may actually have been another of Jennings' inventions. It was, however, the amplifier section for the Univox that Jennings cannibalised into his first amplifier for guitar, the G10. However, he could never get the sound quite the way he wanted it, and in 1957 he turned to friend Dick Denny for help and advice. Denny showed Tom his home-built 15 watt amplifier. It used alternating current rather than direct current supply as was originally designated by the AC1 by Denny. A little under a year later, the pair had formed a partnership under JMI, Jennings Musical Industries. Together, they developed Denny's 15 watt guitar amplifier under the Vox brand. The AC current and 15 watts is what logically gave birth to the name AC15. Denny's choice of EL84 valves for the power amplifier stage gave way to the classic breakup sound, later to become the trademark of Vox amplifiers, as these valves were prone to distortion due to their low headroom. Initially, the distortion was seen as a fault, and Denny reduced the unwanted fuzz sound by introducing a negative feedback circuit, which would return some of the amp signal back into the power amp input and allow the output signal to be smoothed. However, Denny did not like the effect that this had on the sound, and breaking with his best practice for cleaning up hi-fi valve amps, he decided not to incorporate the circuit in the final Class A combo amplifier. So the AC15 would produce breakup when overdriven by high volumes, and this would appeal greatly to guitarists looking for pleasing tone from their amplifiers. Denny was also notoriously hard of hearing, particularly at the top of his frequency range, and it's possible that this, and the fact that he always had the last say on voicing of Vox amps, that likely led to the now famous crisp Vox tone and sound. However, it wasn't only Denny and Jennings that liked the tone. JMI artist, liaison manager Charlie Cobbett, capitalised on the pleasing tone, landing one of the earliest artist endorsement deals during its infancy in the late 1950s by supplying the Shadows with three of the new AC15 amplifiers to replace their ageing Selma backline. This would be the start of the meteoric rise of the Vox brand. Very shrewdly, Vox insisted on their endorsed artists always having the brand in sight on TV and live on stage, so exposure was incredible. 
It was actually due to the shadows that the Vox AC30 was born. At the time, the band were the backing group for teenage heartthrob Cliff Richard. The band would tour and their live shows would be filled with hordes of screaming teenage girls. So loud were these frenzied crowds' screams that the band could no longer hear their AC15 backline properly. They turned to JMI and asked Denny to build them a louder amp. Denny was keen to oblige and set about combining two of his AC15 units into one 2x12 combo, doubling up on everything he put into the smaller version. Jennings was not impressed and told Denny not to waste his time and the company money. Denny continued on regardless until Tom Jennings later found the invoices for the additional materials and after several of the AC30 units were made. Workers at JMI were concerned on the day that Jennings found out and forcefully demanded that Denny join him in his office. Nobody was sure what the upshot would be, leaving most believing that the partnership may be over and Denny fired. However, when Denny emerged from the meeting, he informed his co-workers that Jennings had authorised 10 units of the AC30 to be built, but that was on Denny's head if the project failed. The rest, as they say, is history. The first generation AC30 4 amps supplied to Hank and the boys were in throwback TV front layout, but production models featured the now iconic split panel front format. There were four inputs of course, two for the vibrato channel and the remaining pair for the normal channel. The speakers were Celestian G12 Alnico Blue, although a smaller number of early examples had tan coloured versions of the blue. By 1961 the AC36 was unveiled as a replacement for its four input predecessor. In those days it wasn't unusual for band members to share an amp and so Vox had it covered. The AC36 differed mainly from the previous four input version due to the preamp tubes. In late 1960, Vox redesigned the preamp circuit, replacing the EF86 with an ECC83, better known as the 12AX7, and released this new design as the AC36. The AC36 was now an amp with three channels, each having two inputs. About this time, the Top Boost or Brilliance feature became available as Vox's optional addition of a rear panel mounted circuit introduced extra gain stage and tone controls for bass and treble, as opposed to the single tone control of earlier AC30s. The unit became so popular that its features were soon incorporated into newer AC36 models, and the controls moved from the rear panel to the control panel. Vox AC36 amplifiers from around 1963 had already implemented the top boost, and therefore had three tone controls. People began to refer to these amplifiers as AC30 TBs. Later on, Vox also offered additional versions of the AC30 unit. In addition to the normal version without the top boost and the top boost version, which was a normal version with the Brilliance unit added, Vox, with a slight circuit modification, created two more versions that were voiced as Brilliant Treble and Bass styles. Over the years, many different AC30 models appeared, but many consider the AC30 Super Twin to be the ultimate AC30, with a trapezoid shaped head and a separate speed mounted on a trolley. In spite of at least one AC30 production run titled Limited Edition, production of the AC30 has practically never ceased. Newer AC30s are simply reissues of the various top boost AC30s, AC30TB models. AC30s made between 1989 and 93 also had spring reverb as a standard feature. Since then, there have been various incarnations, including a hand-wired limited edition in 2003, a custom classic in 2004, custom series in 2010, and even a Brian May AC30 BM limited run. Though widely believed to be a Class A amplifier, the AC30 is in fact a Class AB. It uses a quartet of cathode-based EL84 output tubes in push-pull configuration. Personally though, I believe a lot of the sound is down to the two 15 watt Celestian Blue speakers running at full tilt. I think this is what caused so much interest all the way back in the 1960s. Shortly, the list of endorsees would grow thanks to Brian Epstein. The Beatles manager approached Vox to provide free amplifiers for his newly signed act, who had just returned from touring the Hamburg Red Light District. Jennings was characteristically abrupt about giving away his amps to a relatively unknown band, so instead, at first, they arranged a part exchange agreement. Jennings also came to an agreement with Epstein that the band would never be seen with any other brand of amplifier, and they never were. 
Needless to say, over the next few years, the Beatles became arguably the biggest band of all time and changed the face of music forever. This also did wonders for Vox as a brand, who were inundated with orders. Other artists, including fellow Dartford boys, the Rolling Stones, took up playing AC30s and other models developed by Jennings and Denny. One of their road managers actually worked at Vox for a time prior to working with the band. Pete Townsend was given three AC30 units, however Jennings stopped supplying them to him after a third in quick succession returned smashed to bits as part of the Who guitarist's on stage antics. Jennings allegedly told the Who's manager in no uncertain terms exactly where he could go when asking for the fourth amp. Although the company factored out much of the build work alongside employing over 150 people in their assembly workshop in their heyday, they quickly failed to meet the incredibly fast growing demand. At this point, JMI had already secured the European distribution rights for Fender guitars and were also building some wild and wonderful guitars themselves, although by the admission of most staff at JMI their guitars were never of the same high standard as their amplifiers. JMI desperately needed to expand and quickly. That would require major investment to find larger premises and take on more staff. To fund this, Jennings turned to Royston Industries in 1964. They were an engineering firm pioneering the new technologies of black box flight recorders. Moving to Erith in Kent, Jennings sold a significant shareholding to the new firm in the hope that investment and expansion would follow. Sadly, this was not the agenda for Royston, who milked JMI as a cash cow to support their R&D efforts in aviation technology. This was a venture doomed to fail, and in the end, Royston even sacked Tom Jennings from his own company, Vox. Jennings, Dick Denny and John Oram returned to the chip shop in Dartford, Kent to start a game from scratch as Jennings. If Tom Jennings harboured any lingering anger for Royston Industries, he didn't have to wait long for karma to oblige. By 1969, his one-time parent company was bankrupt. And so began the gradual decline in the fortunes of the Vox brand. Albeit with occasional blips of hope, like when it was purchased one time by Gibson and longtime Rickenbacker distributor Rose Morris in the 80s. Unfortunately, without the Vox brand name, Jennings amplifiers too were never destined to the heady heights that Vox once had enjoyed in the 1960s. Since the early 90s, Vox has been owned by Japanese company Korg and they still make highly regarded UK and Chinese made Vox gear. Even through the ever-changing fashions of the music industry and the guitar gear fads that have come and gone, the Vox AC30 has continually and permanently secured its place in the backline of the likes of Brian May of Queen, Irish blues icon Rory Gallagher, U2's The Edge and Paul Weller during his tenure with The Jam. The AC30 encapsulates the sound of the 60s British Invasion sound as well as everything that's electrifying and timeless about the Vox sound. Decades after the birth of JMI, the AC30 remains the ultimate accolade of the accordion teacher Jennings and the half-deaf engineer Denny, who both secured their place in rock and roll history and did their bit to change the world. Mm -hmm.